My name is Elena McNally. I'm the coordinator of the Water Conference this year, supported by the Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust. If you don't know some things about the trust, we conserve 14,000 acres with 35 miles of recreation tra trails for the community to enjoy. We also own Cupsoptic Lake Campground and hold multiple educational um, programs for the people of all ages to have fun and just enjoy this part of Maine. It's a beautiful place. My position as a steward here is to go over the courtesy boat inspectors, the water quality monitors, and the invasive plant patrollers. I was hired by the Maine Conservation Corps, so I'm here until October and to coordinate this water conference. Today we have Dr. Karen Wilson speaking from the University of Southern Maine. She was my professor at the University of Southern Maine and my research mentor for several years. She received her PhD in limnology and zoology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her latest project is researching alewives, otherwise known as river herring in the Presumpscot River. Today she will be talking about our watersheds and, and like the system's health altogether. She'll be talking to about 345 and then we'll save 15 minutes for questions at the end. Or you could type your question into the, there's a chat bubble. And I think you could type it in there. And um, also just to let everyone know that this is being recorded so you could see this later at a later time. All right, Karen, take it. Great, away. thank you so much, Elena. Um, well, everyone, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, once again, wishing that things were not the way that they are and that we could be hanging out together in person. I've spent the last few days uh, um, looking up information about lakes in the Androscoggin, the upper Androscoggin watershed in the Rangeley Lakes area. Um, and I'm really wishing that I had gotten an in-person invite instead and could have spent the time up at Rangeley Lake uh, because what a neat area. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do a very basic um, introduction to water quality. And um, hopefully my objective is that at the end of this conversation, you'll have a better understanding of what types of water quality information lake stewards would gather and why and how you would interpret uh, those data. Um, at the same time, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the lakes in the upper Androscoggin watershed uh, and a few other little details as we go. So you'll also learn a little bit of introductory limnology. Um, so we'll see how this goes. This isn't a very long talk. So um, I'd really enjoy answering questions at the end. Um, as Elena said, type your questions into the chat if you'd like, um, and she can, or to the Q&A, and Elena will help curate those questions at the end. Um, I'm not gonna stop and answer questions right now just because it's hard uh, on Zoom to, to do that easily. Okay, so let me make sure I know what time it is, and we'll give this a try. All right, so uh, again, great to be here. Uh, right now I'm at the University of Southern Maine, so I'm easy to find if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, you can always email me at karen.wilson at maine.edu or look me up on the University of Southern Maine website. And how shall we go forward? <laughs> okay, <laughs> we may have a problem. There we go. Whoop. Wait for it. Okay, so before we really jump into things, um, in the background you can see a uh, topo map of um, the Rangeley Lakes area. And really I'm putting this up here because I want to remind everyone that water goes downhill and that most of these lakes that are in this region are connected in some way or another. And so when we talk about water quality, it's really important to stand back and think about what happens upstream is affecting what's uh, downstream. Um, and that's, that's a really uh, interesting perspective when you're thinking about your own lake and what's happening in your own lake. So what's happening in the watershed, that is the, the area of land that drains into your lake, but also what's happening in the next lake upstream of you and the watershed um, in that region as well. So um, these are things you should be thinking about when you're contemplating water quality, because it's not just the local uh, activity, but the surrounding activity as well. 
So water quality uh, does have some um, uh, legal definitions, um, and these are um, as dictated in the Clean Water Act, um, which was really refers to um, acts that were passed in 1972. And the goal of the Clean Water Act in 1972 was to ensure that all waters of the U.S. were fishable and swimmable, and that discharges were permitted or eliminated by 1987. Um, I think one thing that's very clear in the Rangeley Lakes area is that fishable and swimmable perhaps is not an important goal in the sense that these lakes have been fishable and swimmable for a very long time. But there are other aspects, for example, the lower Androscoggin uh, River, which actually was one of the inspirations for the Clean Water Act um, because of how incredibly polluted it was um, due to the large number of paper mills. Uh, across the length or along the length of the Androscoggin. So up in the headwaters, uh, things aren't bad, but um, the Clean Water Act really was inspired by the Androscoggin River, among other rivers, which is just interesting to think about. So fishable and swimmable, uh, it seems uh, an easy goal for the upper Androscoggin, uh, but for many water bodies in the U.S., uh, we still haven't achieved fishable and swimmable. So in Maine, uh, we also have Maine legislation that covers great ponds, okay? Um, so great ponds are any lakes. Um, uh, all ponds are classified in the same way or the standards are the same for all lakes in Maine. And they follow these. And so what you see here is sort of the legalese um, for uh, what type of water quality we're expecting in our lakes. So they should be in a natural state. Um, but uses can be quite varied. So it might be everything from drinking water, recreation both in and on the water, uh, fishing of various sorts. It might be used for industrial processes. So there might be water withdrawals. Um, the water might be used for cooling in say an electrical plant or hydropower or navigation. And of course, habitat for fish and other water, uh, other wildlife. Um, in Maine, uh, we think of lakes in terms of their trophic state, which is a combination of three measures. One is chlorophyll A, which I'll talk about a bit later and you'll see popping up, but chlorophyll A is a pigment that is contained within the cells of plants that helps with the process of photosynthesis. So is the pigment needed for photosynthesis. So um, uh, limnologists, those who study uh, lakes um, use chlorophyll A as a proxy measure uh, for the little algal cells that float around in the water. Um, it's easier to measure the amount of pigment in the water than it is the number of algal cells in the water. We also use something called a Secchi disk transparency, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the next couple of slides, so I'll leave that for a second. And then total phosphorus. So phosphorus is a limiting nutrient. What that means is if you add more phosphorus to a lake, you'll get more algae growing, you'll get more plant growth. If you have not enough phosphorus, it'll limit the amount of algal growth that you get in the lake. So total phosphorus is a measure of the amount of this nutrient that's in the lake. And that measurement helps us understand what the trophic state is. So the trophic state is really just a calculation based on these three measurements, chlorophyll A, Secchi disk transparency, and total phosphorus. All of these measures must be stable or decreasing and with the acknowledgement that there are natural fluctuations um, in these measurements. Okay. Um, and another uh, standard for main lakes is that they must be free of culturally induced algal blooms, which impair use and enjoyment. And again, this is not something that you'd expect to be a problem in the Rangeley Lake area, but I'll show you a couple of pictures of what an algal bloom might look like. Um, and it's definitely something to, to avoid. When we say culturally induced, we mean anthropogenically or human activity induced algal bloom. So this is when we're adding um, nutrients, for example, to the water. Another measure that's important from the perspective of human health is that E. coli bacteria um, are quite low. So um, E. coli bacteria themselves are not uh, particularly harmful for humans. Um, they are found in the gut of 
mammals, however. And so if you have high levels of E. coli bacteria in your water, it means that there's some source of fecal matter in your water, which may bring with it much more dangerous uh, diseases. Um, so this is something that's often measured when we have a lot of swimming, for example, at a heavily used swimming beach. Another thing that in Maine, um, there's a requirement of no new discharges. And so, for example, a new industry couldn't set up um, set up shop on the side of a lake and start discharging waste into the lake. In fact, the effort has been to reduce discharges as much as possible. Um, and then finally, a change in land use within the whole watershed around that lake. So remember the watershed is the area of land surrounding the lake um, from which water drains into the lake. Um, changes in land use in the watershed may not cause change in trophic state. And so this might apply if there was um, a proposition to put a large mall, shopping mall or something, or, or, um, or even a, a very large um, logging operation might impact uh, uh, a lake. The shopping malls are much worse, by the way, than logging. <laughs> and so if you're interested in the legalese, you can take a look. This is the, this is the statute in, in Maine law uh, to take a look. So this is what we're aiming for when we're looking at water quality. And these are sort of the aspirational um, or the aspirations of, of the state of Maine in terms of maintaining water quality around the state. So this applies to all lakes uh, in the state. So I just wanted you to see sort of what those numbers are and, and kind of what, what this means. Um, so trophic status are these three words across the top of this table, oligotrophic, mesotrophic, and eutrophic. Limnologists usually think of that as oligotrophic being very low nutrients, mesotrophic having sort of moderate nutrients, and eutrophic um, having high levels of nutrients. Usually eutrophic lakes are associated with very heavy human use. We have a few in Maine, but very few. Um, and mesotrophic and oligotrophic are more natural states. That's not entirely true. There are parts of the world that have enough nutrients in the lake that they, we would consider them eutrophic lakes without any human intervention. Um, and so you can see that there are those parameters, the Secchi disk depth, chlorophyll A and total phosphorus. And then these are some of the numbers that we're looking for. And I'll refer back to this uh, table in a little bit. Uh, suffice it to say, sort of jumping to the chase, most of the lakes in the Rangeley Lake area fall within that oligotrophic or mesotrophic um, range and not up at the eutrophic range. Okay. So I wanted to talk about Secchi disk transparency because this is one of the easiest ways for lake monitors to keep track of what's going on their lake. Um, and in fact, um, and it's also inexpensive um, and something very simple. If you wanna try taking a Secchi disk transparency reading, you can go to the Lake Stewards of Maine online uh, training app and try it yourself to see what it's like. Um, this is a very simple measure. So this is a Secchi disk on the left there, and you can see it is white and black disk. It's a weighted disk, and generally it's suspended in the water using a tape measure. And the objective is simply to um, uh, measure at what depth does that disk dis disappear and then reappear um, as you lower it down and then back up. Okay, so in turn, if you're looking for a clear lake, the greater the Secchi disk transparency means the deeper you could see that disk. Um, so this is an extraordinarily simple way to measure uh, your lake characteristics. It's also kind of interesting because if you multiply the Secchi disk transparency depth by two, that gets, for most lakes, gives you an idea of how deep you'd expect to see um, plants or algae growing in the lake depending upon characteristics of that lake. So Secchi disk transparency or that uh, water transparency is affected by a number of different things. These include phytoplankton or microscopic plants. So you'll hear me describe uh, these microscopic plants as either algae or phytoplankton. Um, limnologists, when they talk about phytoplankton, that word simply breaks down into phyto, which is plant, and plankton, which means it floats around in the water, and 
doesn't swim very well. Although ironically, a lot of phytoplankton, in fact, are so small that they have flagellum and they swim, um, but not very well compared to a fish. Um, so the more phytoplankton you have in a lake, the greener it looks like this Weber pond algal bloom in my lower left hand corner. Um, and the lower or smaller your secchi disc transparency is. So you really can't get that um, disc in very far. So this uh, photo of Weber Pond in the lower left corner, uh, I think we just we uh, measure the secchi disc depth or transparency as about 1.5 meters that day. Um, however, the transparency of lakes, so the uh, how well water uh, can, or light can move through the lake, excuse me, um, is also affected by other things. So for example, this middle photo is Blackman Stream, which drains a very large um, wetland complex in Bradley, Maine, um, over near Bangor. And you can see, so this is a photo I took underwater, and you can see the brown color. So that color is not the substrate, but in fact, the water. It looks like tea, so we think about it as tea. And so there's a lot of lakes and rivers in Maine that we consider, we call it stained. Um, and this is, in fact, um, organic molecules uh, that are dissolved in the water and give it this color. So that also will reduce the secchi disc transparency of a particular lake. And then finally, you can see this photo in my lower right hand corner of the screen. This is silt um, being transported by the little river, which is down near Portland, this particular little river down near Portland, which is entering the Presumpscot River. And so the water that you see in the back that looks darker, it's actually quite clear. Um, that's coming from Sebago Lake, so very, very clear water. The Little River, on the other hand, winds its way through uh, a um, geological formation of clays. And so it tends to carry with it uh, quite a lot of suspended particles. Uh, and so when these two rivers uh, uh, intersect, you see um, this really dramatic difference between the two water bodies. Um, and so silts and clays can also change the secchi disc transparency quite dramatically in some cases. Um, you'll notice I said silt and clays from erosion. In the case of the Little River, uh, we think this might just be a natural state of transporting this level of sediments, and that is true for some uh, rivers not always true for main rivers. And so often this is really an impact from erosion. And I want to, I'll say this again, I want to say it now. Um, one of the key things to know about lake health is that phosphorus, that limiting nutrient that I mentioned earlier, is carried by silts and clays and other soil particles. That are caused that are moved due to erosion and this is simply because the phosphorus molecule absorbs onto clays um, and then the clay is transported and it also transports the phosphorus um, and so one of the critical ways to reduce the input of phosphorus into lakes is to make sure that there is no erosion along the shorelines of lakes or erosion from camp roads leading down to the lake or erosion in front of your camp and so on. Um, so that's something that's always really important to, to keep in mind. Whoops. Okay. Um, Secchi in of itself doesn't necessarily tell you if I just went and took one measurement of Secchi, uh, it might tell us a little bit, but what we really need to know is that long-term trend. Um, and so uh, Secchi is one of those measurements that's useful to have week after week or month after month um, from year to year so that you can see changes uh, in what's going on in the lake because it's very reflective of a number of different changes in water quality. This is a crazy example. <laughs> from my friends at Highland Lake in Wyndham, Maine. Um, Highland Lake, ha because it's so close to Portland and has a year-round population, has had, uh, and because there's some tremendous water quality volunteers on the lake, has had uh, an amazing amount of effort put into measuring Secchi over the years. And so on this graph, you'll see the year on the x-axis from 19, 
before 1980 all the way up to 2020. Um, and then on the y-axis is that SECI depth measurement. And so we've arranged this to reflect um, how you think of SECI. So that is the surface of the lake is actually up here at the top of the graph at zero. And then the Secchi depth <laughs> goes down so that the deeper you are, the better or clearer the lake is. So the lower you are on the graph, the clearer the lake is. So in this case, um, the Secchi was a really important indicator of changes in the lake. So you'll see that first stretch of data from before 1980 to well into the mid to late 1990s. And one of the things that happens is if you take all of those readings which were taken weekly or maybe every two weeks or maybe monthly and you look at their average value you can see that over time the Secchi depth is getting less and less so we're approaching the top of this graph um, that actually was an indication to the department of environmental protection that something was going on in the lake and so in that blue section in the 2000s um, began to implement uh, a large number of erosion control efforts around the lake. So watershed improvements to reduce the input of soils that are carrying phosphorus into the lake. And you can see that the Secchi disk transparency sort of leveled off. And then at the end of the record, you'll see that there are some measurements way at the top of the graph, which are in that green um, bracket there, and those represent algal blooms that occurred in the lake for a number of years in a row. Um, and that triggered another series of studies trying to figure out why were there suddenly algal blooms going on in the lake. Um, and right now, our hypothesis is, in fact, food web changes maybe uh, cause that change in transparency. So I put this up here to show you how you can use Secchi to as a reflection of what's going on in the lake. So it's an extraordinarily simple measurement with um, a lot of good uses. Okay, so the other piece of information that is routinely collected on lakes are dissolved oxygen and temperature profiles. So this is simply measuring the amount of oxygen in the water and the temperature uh, and it's generally measured from the surface of the water at one meter increments from the top to the deepest point in the lake. And this actually can tell us a lot about the processes that are occurring in the lake and what type of habitat that lake provides for, for example, cold water fisheries. Um, this is particularly important in the Rangeley Lakes region because almost all of the lakes uh, in the region are what are considered cold water fisheries. So this is trout or uh, landlocked salmon and, and other fishes like that that prefer to be cool in the summer. Now there's something that's important to keep in mind, some basic um, actually physics, and that is that temperature and dissolved oxygen, so what's available for those fish to breathe um, or invertebrates or zooplankton, whatever organism it is in the lake. Temperature and dissolved oxygen are usually inversely related, or to put it another way, if you have lower temperatures, you tend to have more oxygen. And if you have higher temperatures, you have less dissolved oxygen. Um, and then there's an LS. That's So that's sort of all things equal, unless you have organisms or sometimes chemical processes that are using up the oxygen faster than it can be renewed, either through photosynthesis, that is the production of oxygen by plants, or from mixing with air. And this is something we call biological demand. Um, and this becomes important to understand when you're trying to interpret what a, temper which, uh, what a dissolved oxygen and temperature profile will tell you. So this is what a profile might look like if you were to graph it up. So let's look at this graph. So again, because limnologists do this kind of thing, you'll see that on the y-axis is depth into the lake, but we have the top of the lake here at zero, and here is the bottom of the lake in this hypothetical graph down here at 30. 
And then this is temperature data. So temperature is on the x-axis. So the way you interpret this is in the first top, say, seven meters of the lake, maybe a little less, um, temperature was roughly the same. And then you have this really dramatic change as you go down towards 10 meters. And then from maybe eight meters to 12 meters, temperature drops off dramatically. And then from say 12 meters down to 30, the temperature is almost exactly the same all the way through the water column. So you can um, at each meter, okay? This is a classic example of lake stratification. So the lake is what we call stratified. And what that means is it's actually two bodies of water that are isolated from each other. And so this happens every summer, starting in usually late June, early July, depending upon how cold your spring has been. Um, and what you have at the top is a warm body of water, which we call the epilimnion or epi for above, like your skin epidermis, for example. Um, and then you have the metalimnion, which is defined by this dramatic change in temperature. And then at the bottom, we call it the hypolimnion or the bottom water. And what's key to know here is that the differences in that temperature actually is a, um, results in a difference in density of these two water bodies. So that warmer water is lighter, it's up on top, the colder water is heavier, and it's down at the bottom. Because of that density difference, the two bodies of water don't mix. It's kind of like mixing oil and water, although oil and water have greater differences in density than these two uh, bodies of water here, shown here. However, it's the same idea. Um, you also may be familiar with this phenomenon. If you've ever seen freshwater streams flowing into an ocean, the freshwater will actually float on top and the salt water will stay below. And that's because of a density difference for the most part. Um, so what you have here then is the epilimnion is highly mixed because it's just sort of this other, this layer at the top, you've got wind energy that's mixing at all times. And so it has the same temperature until you hit the change in density. The hypolimnion uh, in larger lakes, there are some currents down there, but the currents aren't great enough to overcome the change in density. And so it stays isolated. The last key thing you need to know is that dissolved oxygen does not dissolve across that thermocline very well. Okay, so what that means is the epilimnion is in contact with the atmosphere and dissolve oxygen dissolves into the water and it mixes throughout the epilimnion. In the hypolimnion, once stratification starts up, is isolated from the atmosphere, it's also isolated from dissolved oxygen. And so whatever volume of oxygen you have at the bottom of the lake is what the lake has for the rest of the summer. Okay. All right, hopefully that made some sense and I will show you what that means. So this is just the definitions. Um, I don't wanna complicate things too much other than to say this process of stratification is affected by heat and wind as I mentioned, it's maintained by differences in water density and it's biologically significant. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Okay. Um, lakes are not always stratified. They are only stratified in the summer. And then interestingly enough, they are stratified also in the winter under the ice. And that's a whole nother discussion we can have. <laughs> um, but this is just showing a typical lake where in the spring, the water temperature is the same from top to bottom. There's lots of winds and the lake is essentially circulating throughout. As you get warm summer days, nice calm warm summer days, that warms up the top few meters of the lake. You get the density difference occurring and it'll stay like this all summer until the fall when you have colder weather, you have storms, lots of wind that cools down the epilimnion until the two temperatures of the two different water bodies are almost the same and they'll start to mix because the density difference just won't be enough to keep them separate. 
almost all lakes in the Rangeley Lake area stratify, as far as I can tell. Um, the only lakes that probably don't would be very shallow ponds because stratification in a small pond can set up temporarily, but usually wind events are enough to mix it up um, because the whole lake will warm because it's not a lot of volume of water. Okay, so what does this mean for Rangeley Lake, uh, Rangeley Lakes area lakes? Um, so I just wanted to show two different ponds in the Rangeley Lake area. Um, and these are, uh, these were both measured in August of 2018. These are profile data and on each graph you'll see both oxygen profile and temperature profile. So what you want to do with your, your eyes is look for that epilimnion. So let's look at Gull Pond here on the left. There's the epilimnion, same temperature in the top, also same amount of dissolved oxygen. And you would just read down. So the dissolved oxygen is about uh, eight parts per million and the temperature in that epilimnion is about 24. So that's sort of a nice room temperature. Okay, then here is that metalimnion, that's that transition from the warm epilimnion to the cold hypolimnion. But you'll notice that dissolved oxygen does the same thing. It's uh, at eight parts per million up here in the epilimnion and then it drops down to pretty much zero in the hypolimnion. So remember this is in August. So in August that lake has been stratified for some time. And so what this tells us is that there's something in the bottom of the lake that's using up the oxygen. Usually that's some version of decomposition. The key thing from a fisheries point of view is this means that in the part of the lake where the temperatures are cold, down there around 10 degrees Celsius, there's also not much oxygen. So in lakes where the hypolimnion loses its oxygen over the course of the summer, um, you also end up with uh, cold water species kind of getting um, compressed in terms of where can they live where the temperature is cold, but there's still dissolved oxygen. So for these, for fish in this lake, um, fish generally need, especially cold water fishes, want, you know, eight parts per thousand. So that means that they're up here at four meters where the temperature is around 24 degrees Celsius. Um, and so that can be a problem. Uh, here is Round Pond, a similar depth, uh, but by mid-August in 2018, it still had some oxygen in the hypolimnion, uh, which is a little better, but still it's not a lot of oxygen for cold water fish species. So these are uh, not so deep ponds. They're all about 40 feet in depth. So this is feet, the depth in feet, and this is the depth in meters. So let's just take a look at some of the deeper lakes. So these are the Richardson, Richardson lakes on the left and Rangeley Lake on the right. Um, and these lakes have a different pattern. Um, so for example, Richardson Lake still has the epilimnion, the metalimnion, and the hypolimnion, uh, but the oxygen does pretty well. There's a little bit of drop off of oxygen, as you go down into the hypolimnion, but it's still fairly high, except for way down here. My guess is, in fact, the probe went into the sediments at the very bottom of that record. Um, but let's contrast that to Rangeley Lake, a little bit deeper lake. And this is kind of interesting. Here you also have uh, the epilimnion, but it's not quite as straight up and down here. And that's because the very top you have um, extra stratification. So this was probably after a number of really warm days, so you developed a secondary thermocline, we would call it. Um, and then uh, it drops off, so here's our thermocline or metalimnion, and the temperature then is quite cold at the bottom of the lake. In fact, it's really cold down at eight degrees. Oxygen, interestingly enough, is uh, about the same up here. <laughs> And then it actually increases in the bottom of the lake. And that's because, that's for two reasons. One, uh, because that water is so cold that it holds quite a bit of oxygen. And two, there's probably not a lot of decomposition going on in the bottom of the lake. And actually three, there's a huge volume of water down there in the hypolimnion. So it holds a lot of oxygen. Um, so anyway, so that's really interesting. So very different looking profiles in Rangeley Lake 
uh, versus Richardson's Lake versus uh, the smaller ponds. So all of these profiles can tell you a huge amount about the lake just by looking at what the profile looks like in later summer after there's been lots of biological activity going on in the lake um, and lots of opportunity for decomposition down there in the hypolimian. So if you've thought about uh, becoming a lake monitor or you've done some lake monitoring, hopefully this will help you understand why it's actually really important for us to collect dissolved oxygen and uh, temperature data. And I would want to say is, again, it's a sort of a long-term perspective of monitoring is if, for example, range of the lakes in the next 10 years started to have less and less oxygen in the middle of August, then you know that things are changing in the lake and, and, and need to be investigated. Okay. Um, and finally, the last thing that are measured routinely in lakes in Maine, um, if possible, are nutrients. And I already talked about, um, I already talked about uh, total phosphorus and why that's important. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner is a, is a photo of a floating algal bloom. This is, uh, I think, in Three Mile Lake in the Kennebec watershed. Um, this is not what you want uh, in Rangeley Lake. So um, one of the nice things about the Rangeley area lakes is they're generally quite low in both total phosphorus and chlorophyll. So on the left-hand side, you see a, um, <laughs> you see, sorry, you see a um, plot of all the lakes that I looked at in the Rangeley Lakes area. Uh, for total phosphorus along the uh, x-axis down there and mean chlorophyll on the y-axis. If there was a really strong relationship between the two of uh, these variables, you would see a really strong line. Um, and that's a slight indication, mostly driven by that upper right-hand point in the graph. Um, but this does sort of, this is the pattern you'd expect to see in that you'd expect that with more total phosphorus, you'd see more chlorophyll. And let me just remind you that the chlorophyll is a proxy measure for this algae that you see in the photo. So this would have very high chlorophyll because lots and lots of that pigment used in photosynthesis. Um, the Rangeley Lakes all have quite low total phosphorus. I think the highest I saw was maybe 13, 10 or 13 parts per billion. Um, nowhere near the 20 parts per billion that are, ex that are associated with prolonged algal blooms. Um, so that's good. So keeping track of total phosphorus is always good because if you start to see increases in total phosphorus, you know that you have some source of nutrients coming into the lake and that the result might be unsightly algal blooms. Okay, so uh, I always want to end a conversation about lakes and water quality to remind people uh, sort of what you need to do to maintain good water quality in lakes. Um, the, uh, the basics are pretty simple and you probably all know these, and that is uh, reducing nutrient inputs into the lake. And that can be done very simply by um, reducing erosion on camp roads and paths that lead down to the water. Uh, there's all sorts of resources in Maine on ways to do this. There's grants to apply for to do this. Um, this is something that is uh, is possible. Lots of examples on how to, to do this. Um, camp roads are often the biggest source of erosion in a lake's watershed. Uh, another easy one is simply not to fertilize your lawn. Um, just don't do it because much of fertilizer that's applied to lawns ends up running off. And then um, the other one is to maintain your planted buffer between your camp and the lake. Uh, there's a really interesting study that was done uh, comparing Vermont lakes to Maine lakes. Um, and what they found is, and because Maine has a much stronger regulation for maintaining plants as a buffer zone between camps and the lake. Um, and, you know, it's not true for all camps. There are some camps that are, uh, that were built well before the shoreline um, 
laws were in place. But in general, if you were to boat around in Vermont lakes, you'd find that there's a lot more open lawns leading directly down to the lake. And it does seem to have had a big impact on water quality. So over, overall, main lakes have much better water quality, even when you um, control for lake area and the number of houses around the lake and development and so on and so forth. So this is really important. Finally, of course, prevent invasive species. This might include checking boat trailers for milfoil, as Elena was referring to at the very beginning. Um, and another one that's near and dear to my heart, don't release, release live bait, rather be them minnows or crayfish. Um, in fact, don't use live bait at all, um, unless you've caught it in that lake that you are fishing in. Also don't release any non-native fish species, which happens much more often than one might think. Um, before I end, I just wanted to put a plug in for looking for crayfish. I worked on rusty crayfish for my PhD work. Uh, they're quite invasive in some parts of the country, uh, actually I should say in North America. And although they've been found in the Range of the Lakes area since the, 19, since the 1960s, um, they don't seem to be having as big an of an effect, or at least we think so. Uh, I do have rusty crayfish that have been collected from the area, certainly Rangeley Lakes and some of the other ponds. Um, I'm always interested in getting specimens from the Rangeley Lakes area, um, trying to figure out how far they've spread and then what kind of impacts they've had, if any, on the lakes. If you're interested more in that, you can contact me and I'm happy to talk to you more. So for more information about your lake, um, I really recommend taking a look at the website lakesofmaine.org. These are the data that are collected by the Maine DEP and by lake stewards around the lake. Um, if you are interested in becoming a lake monitoring volunteer, um, I just want to point out that the, universe, or the uh, state of Maine has the longest lake monitoring volunteer program in the entire country. Um, you uh, can contact um, Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust, uh, volunteer with the trust, and then you'd be certified through the Lake Stewards of Maine, so you can take a look at there. Uh, and finally, questions, and also thanks to Elena for some really spectacular photos uh, for this presentation. And I will stop there. That was great, Karen. Thanks so much for doing this for us. I did get one question in. Um, anyone who doesn't have any questions, you're able to log off, or if you want to stick around for questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, so the question was from Andrew Cuther. How much effect do camp septic systems have on lakes? Mm. Yeah, so uh, if a septic system is well maintained and properly constructed, it shouldn't have a big effect. Uh, however, um, one of the things that's really important for camp owners to do is to uh, make sure that your septic systems are operating properly. Um, the best thing you can do is actually be on a, on a, a wastewater treatment system, but we know that in much of Maine, that's not a possibility. Uh, so uh, make sh making sure that those septic systems are working properly, making sure that they're sited in a way that there's some distance between them and the lakeshore, uh, and certainly leaky septic systems or maybe old camps with no septic system at all can be a very important source of um, nutrients to a lake. So yeah, that's pretty important to, to maintain. Okay, um, great answer. Rosie <laughs> from Highland Lake says, on the graph of Secchi Dis from Highland Lake, were the dots on the graph representative, representative of the monthly average? Mm, good question, Rosie. Um, so those dots are individual observations. So there were lots and lots of them in Highland Lake because of Rosie and uh, other great volunteers on the lake. Um, and I can't say enough about the importance of having a good group of volunteers uh, who are able to um, just monitor what's going on from day to day. Uh, the reason why the state of Maine started uh, Lake Stewards of Maine way back in the 70s. So Lake Stewards of Maine sort of operates independently of the Department of Environmental Protection, but it was started by the Environmental Part Department of Environmental Protection because there are simply too many lakes in Maine for the state to monitor on a regular basis. Okay, she also said also on the same graph, does the red line represent 
changes in the annual average of the that's right yeah right exactly okay and then david miller our executive director here at the trust says why are rangeley lakes the best lakes in the <laughs> 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 well, I'd say those photos say a lot there. Um, you know, actually, I think I think uh, more seriously, one is because there is much less human development in the region, um, and so that is uh, that is great because human development in general has been the downfall of of lakes in terms of water quality. Um, so there's a very strong relationship between the number of buildings, for example, or impervious surface that is like roads and parking lots and roofs, rooftops and so on, and water quality. So as you add those types of structures and that kind of infrastructure, um, water quality tends to decrease. So the Range of the Lakes area has going for it tremendous amounts of forested land, which is, um, you can think of forested land as a, a, a filter for all the water falling on the watershed. And so those forests filter out uh, nutrients, they grab nutrients, and so what what actually arrives at the lake is very high water quality, just to start with. That's a great question. <laughs> Go ahead. Next question. I live on Gold Pond for the past three years. We have noticed a bloom in late August slash early September. See more near the side. I guess it was just more of a comment than a question. Yeah, so Gull Lake is kind of interesting, and I don't, did I show, a, I can't remember if I showed, let me see if I can get up there. Um, so Gull Pond as one of the profiles. Yeah, yeah, so, so that profile is, is indicative of a lot of biological activity going on in the upper part of the lake in that epilimnion, um, because for the oxygen to disappear, you need algae and zooplankton and things that are growing in the upper part of the lake to die and fall to the bottom of the lake. Um, and so when that happens, that material that falls to the bottom of the lake is decomposed and that often uses up the dissolved oxygen. And so, yeah, looking at that profile, I would guess that um, there's a possibility that you are having algal blooms on the lake. I think Gull Pond is also maybe one of the ones that has, I don't want to say this without actually looking, hang on. Uh, let's see, so Gull Pond has, has had some higher phosphorus readings. Now this 10 here is getting closer to where you might want to be a little more concerned about phosphorus, but I just want to point out that was one solitary reading it's supposed to be an average, but it's only one. <clears throat> and most of the other readings that, these are surface grabs that I put up on this table, but there are other readings and they're not that high. Um, however, you might have internal phosphorus cycling occurring in the pond. And that is a bit of an explanation. Um, it only occurs when the hypolimnia the lower part of the lake goes anoxic, that is oxygen disappears. So that might be happening in Gull Pond. Amanda contributed to the group chat. Gliotrichia is on Gull on Gull Pond. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. We got another question. What effects okay. water quality are you seeing in the state from climate change? I knew that one was coming. Oh, yeah, that's a big question. Um, well, we talked a bunch about stratification. Um, stratification and how strong the stratification is and when it occurs during the year and how long it goes for is very dependent on climate. So for example, if you have really warm springs with not a lot of rain, those are perfect conditions for stratification to start. Um, so this year, for example, I'm sure there are many lakes around the, around the state that stratified during June because at least down in this part of the state where I am, we had no rain for what, three weeks, it was warm, it wasn't very stormy. Um, and so when that happens, um, you get, let me just go back up here. When you're looking at these profiles, you end up with a really steep change in temperature. So that thermocline or metalimnion area might only be a meter or two. And then the density difference between the top part of the lake and the bottom part of the lake becomes even stronger. Uh, or bigger, bigger difference. 
The other thing that happens is if your lake stratifies early in June instead of early July, you have another month where the hypolimnion at the bottom of the lake has um, no access to new oxygen. So you might run out of oxygen like Gull Pond did in this year in 2018 um, earlier in the summer. And if you actually have internal phosphorus cycling occurring in that lake, it'll occur for a longer period of time because you've run out of oxygen for a longer period of time and so on and so forth. So um, yes, in fact, uh, climate change does have a really big impact. So this just, that's just one way and that simply is impacting this physical structure of the lake. Um, and there's there's many other ways. Uh, if you have, we're predicted to have more larger rainstorms. Uh, that's going to wash more, cause more erosion, for example, coming into the lakes, bringing a higher likelihood of phosphorus being washed into the lakes. Uh, anyway, so you can you can you can go on from there. But yes, we would anticipate that climate change will impact biological processes and physical processes like stratification, among others. That's a good question. Williams commented, climate warming is shortening the duration of ice cover in the mm -hmm. world. That's right. That's right. So you're going to have a shorter ice on period. So that means that in the spring, there's a longer period of time for mixing to occur. Yeah. OK. Good. Excellent question. A lot of questions right now. I don't know if we should wait for a couple more to roll in, maybe. Anyone else? Um, I do really wish that I could be up there in person. <laughs> well, um, if there are no more questions, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Again, you can find me very easily on the University of Southern Maine's website. I'm happy to answer all questions limnology related or rusty crayfish uh, related or um, in some cases is fish related. <laughs> Sorry, another chat. Um, so I'm easy to find and happy to answer questions. You can shoot me an email.